it allowed me then to create that culture within the group that I was in to say, listen, there is nothing you can say in this conversation that will be offensive if it's done in the right way with the right heart. All we're simply trying to do is figure out how to work better together. My name is Linda Laurel, and I'm asking you to have the courage to listen with an open mind to all of our voices, because our voices matter. I want to take a moment to thank BMW of West Houston for sponsoring this episode of our Voices Matter podcast. BMW, of course, is known as the ultimate driving machine because of its precision and power. As someone who has driven a BMW for many years now, I can attest to that firsthand. But I think what's even more important, especially about this particular BMW dealership, is that it understands the power and the impact of giving back to its community. BMW of West Houston is known for its support of countless local charities, and that is important to us here at Our Voices Matter podcast. So if you choose to do business with BMW of West Houston, not only will you be getting the stellar first class service that the dealership is known for, but you can also rest assured that you are doing business with a dealership that truly cares about and gives back to its community. Hey, everybody, it's Linda Laurel. Welcome to another episode of our Voices Matter podcast. My guest today is Monica Cole. Monica is an executive vice president at Wells Fargo, and she didn't take the traditional route to getting into the financial industry. That's one of the things that we talk about today. Um, Monica has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Christian Brothers University and an MBA from Clark Atlanta University. At Wells Fargo, she leads a team of 230 in three distinct but complementary businesses. Now, being a part of a team is really where Monica thrives, and she uses her time as a collegiate basketball player and the experiences that she learned on the court as a leader within Wells Fargo. We talk about her leadership style, her mentoring, DEI, and where corporate America is and how it can be better. And she shares some really poignant personal stories that help sort of connect the dots and tie it all together. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Monica Cole. Monica, it is a pleasure to have you on our Voices Matter podcast. Thanks for making time to talk with us. Linda, I'm super excited to be here with you. So um, there's so much for us to talk about in your role um, as an EVP at, at Wells Fargo and all of the, the different things that you've done. But before we sort of dive into that, you could just give our audience a little bit of a, of a background on how you ended up getting to the, the very prominent position that you have now with Wells Fargo. It was by sheer accident, Linda. I was actually trained as a mechanical engineer when I went to undergrad, but uh, quickly decided I need to get a graduate degree with some background in finance. And I went to an HBCU here in Atlanta, Clark Atlanta University, and was asked then to think about joining the bank for a summer internship with Norwest in Minneapolis and literally gave up my opportunity to be an engineer to join the banking industry. And before that, Linda had never even balanced my checkbook. Yes. So <laughs> it, was, it was a real leap of faith for not only me, but the organization. But, but I will tell you this, the 27 years I've been with, with Wells Fargo and its predecessor companies, it has been an amazing journey. I started out in the training program. I was actually one of... Um, one of very few Black people in the training program back then in Minneapolis. Uh, and it was a, just a wonderful experience. The company embraced us. They really talked to us about developing our career. I moved from there up to Atlanta to join Wachovia at the time and took my career into different places that would allow me to climb the ladder. So I effectively went from lending as a cash flow lender to learning how to be an asset-based lender, I had absolutely no idea what asset-based lenders did, but raised my hand and said I would do it. And if you're in banking, what they tell you is you need to know that not every loan is a good loan. 
And so I went to our workout group and learned how to work out of challenging loans. And, and from there had an opportunity uh, in the midst of a disruptive event within the organization to lead my first team. Let that team went on to run half the US and Canada, had an opportunity to move to places like St. Louis and Chicago, see more of the company, understand the culture. And about three years ago, Linda, I got a call from my now uh, leader who said, listen, we really want you to come and join agribusiness, food and beverage at the time to build a vertical. It was the first time we were going to attempt that in the organization. And I remember saying to him, I know so little about agriculture. Are you sure you really want me? And he said, I want a strategist and I want someone who can think differently. So I took that assignment a little over three years ago. We have now expanded it, Linda to be agribusiness, food, and hospitality. So think about this. I run a business, everything from seed to table, no matter where you consume it, in restaurants, in your home, in casinos, pick it up at convenience stores, in hotels. And it is just a beautiful intersection of the power of what this bank brings uh, to a group like mine. Wow. Well, where do I begin? Okay. <laughs> So what what stood out to me, the first thing that stood out to me, well, there are many things, but one of the things that I want to pick up on is the fact that you said you were offered something that you knew absolutely nothing about and you raised your hand and said, okay, I'll figure it out. That is rare for women and especially women of color traditionally to do that. And, you know, so often, I mean, you, you speak at events, I speak at events, we're, you know, in professional circles all the time. And one of the things that I know I constantly hear is that usually whenever there's an opportunity that comes up and you don't know anything about what it is, the man will always raise his hand and say, oh, I know how to do this. I got this. And he knows nothing about it. And the woman usually second guesses herself and says, I don't know how to do that. So I'm not even going to raise my hand. Why did you raise your hand? What was it in within you that said, I got this, I'm going to go for it? Well, I think a couple of things, Linda. I learned a long time ago, and you can imagine growing up in, in the South, in Mississippi, in a large family, that you had to figure things out. There was never this, this process of catering to you and developing you. You were told by your parents, your grandparents, get this done, you had responsibilities. So I learned very quickly that I had to figure things out. And then as an athlete, which is, is really how I think about how my entire leadership style has been developed, how I think about going after opportunities and strategies. As an athlete, what you start to understand fairly quickly is you can't do it by yourself. And so you have to have the right talent around you supporting you you get people that are better than you are so that you can reach your highest potential and you work together cohesively to get to an ultimate outcome. It's no different in business. So when I'm presented with opportunities to do something that I may feel like I have no background in, my first question is, tell me what the team looks like. Because if I can assess the team, then I know I can uh, surround myself with capable people and I have enough confidence in myself to coach, if you will, our ability to get to the ultimate goal. I love that. That is, that is not the question that, was, that would have come to my mind. What does the team look like? So I know one of the things that you do um, in your role at Wells Fargo is that you mentor a lot. So tell me about, um, about your mentoring style and, and what it is that you want your mentees to get that perhaps you wish you had been told when you were on the other side of that coin. Yeah, I, I love to mentor. My assistant gives me such a hard time about, listen, you don't have the capacity to take on one more, one more person. And I always think that I do because someone helped me get here. I didn't get here on my own. But what I tell all of my mentees is this has to be a two-way street. We need to learn from each other. We need to trust each other. And the one thing that I am adamant about doing is full transparency, no political responses, no reading between the lines. And I, in, in corporate America, 
so often when you're asking for feedback, when you're looking for direction, you get this political sort of response to how you manage your career. And you, and you do have to navigate what you see versus what is happening to you. So when I'm, when I'm a mentor, what I say is, I need to get to know you. I need to understand what you want. And then you need to understand that I'm going to give you constructive feedback, no matter how difficult it is to hear. And frankly, I expect you to give it to me. So I may actually invite them on some of my calls when I'm talking to my teams about things that are not um, a priority or confidential for us so they can see how I interact with my team and give me feedback. I love that. I absolutely love that. So one of the things that um, I know you have many roles, but one of them is also in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And you have some, some very strong and maybe some would say outspoken opinions about, um, about DEI in, in corporate America, what it is, what it is not, and what it can and should be. So I'm going to I'm going to set it up and let you <laughs> take the ball from there and, and go and go all the way down the court and dunk if you like. <laughs> oh, this is, this is, this could be a career debilitating move for me, uh -oh. but, <laughs> but no, listen, I, I think from the day I joined Wells Fargo and, and frankly, what I love most about it is for whatever reason, it has afforded me the opportunity to be me. And I remember, Linda, going as far back as the O.J. Simpson case, which you will remember, mm -hmm. right? Such, a, such an emotional, heated case. I was having lunch with, you know, then I was just a young tra trainee. I was having lunch with one of the executives. And he asked a question around why Black America was supporting O.J. Mm. And, and, and I looked at him and I said, you got to be kidding me. Black America isn't supporting OJ. Black America is supporting Johnny Cochran's attempt to beat a system that was set up against us. And that is what is fascinating. So that led to a conversation around then diversity within our organization. And to your comment around being very outspoken, what I said to him at the time was, you can't tell me you're committed to diversity if the schools you are recruiting at are not diverse themselves. So when you're going to universities and they have less than a 2% diverse population, you have zero interest in diversity at this organization. And I'm so thankful that Wells Fargo over the years has embraced HBCUs. They've embraced um, organizations that have a huge Asian population, a huge Latinx population. Uh, I am very vocal with our organization and leaders in our organization around stop using the phrase, we know the best people out there. Because unless you know everyone that's doing the job, you have absolutely no idea who the best are out there. And so expand your circle, make your circle of trust diverse. And when you start to bring diversity into your personal circle of trust, then you can understand how to go about building a more inclusive, a more diverse, and a more powerful team. I was reading um, an article that you wrote where you were talking about having been in a room and you were asking people a series of questions about DEI and they would raise their hands. Yes. You know, how many of you in an organization have, um, you know, a, a DEI program and then how many of you, blah, blah, blah. And then when you got to the question about um, how many of you do blind resume recruiting? No hands went up. So talk about that, if you if you would, please. Yeah, Linda, I think the studies will show that that we make unconscious decisions based on the names we see at the top of a resume. And almost uncontrollably, we decide whether or not that person is a good fit. We start to draw an image of that individual in our mind. And, and so one of the things I love about a blind resume is if you take that, those descriptors out, the name, and, and even the subtle descriptors where people will list their association with sororities and fraternities, yep. 
which also sends a signal. Yep. And what you start to focus on is the body of work and how that body of work fits into your ability to achieve your objective. Then all of a sudden, your candidate pool starts, starts to look very differently. One of the things that I talk about is if we are recruiting from these resumes, people who think like we do have the same experiences that we do, we are missing out on something incredible. So think again with my sports background, how you build a basketball team as an example. You can't have five point guards on the team. You need people to play different roles. So in corporate America, when you're thinking about how to build a team, you need to think about very different skill sets and how best to utilize them to work together as one. And in my opinion, when you go to a blind resume and you're looking at the body of work only, then you can truly start to shape this team to be most powerful because they have a diverse set of backgrounds and skills. And then the names and the affiliations don't really matter at that point. Yeah. So over the last um, you know, year and a half, two years or so, there's been huge emphasis on social justice and DEI in the corporate workspace uh, in, in the wake of George Floyd and countless others. Um, how much progress do you think we've made in that time? And where do you think we're, and I say, I say we, I'm talking about, say, the collective corporate America, I'm not talking about specifically Wells Fargo, but just in general, where do you think um, we're still lacking when it comes to the DEI space? I think there was obviously a heightened awareness of what I am now calling systemic challenges, because I've learned during the time of Rihanna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery that using the word systemic racism starts to shut people down. And, and so and another thing to add to that, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to, <laughs> white privilege <laughs> is another one that can it turns off a lot of people in terms of the conversation so go ahead and you're you're exactly right so we have to we have to word things so that you keep people engaged in the conversation mm -hmm. and so i talk about the systemic challenges that exist in corporate america and we were awakened to that not only the, the historically the heterosexual white male that has been in power in corporate america but all genders and races were awakened to the challenges we all face to just try and be our own individual selves and to climb the ladder. What I saw and am still seeing from corporate America in general is this elevation of, of in particular, people of color to non PL responsibility roles. And these roles, are critical. They have a ton of influence and they have a ton of power. Historically, what I've seen, the ability to shape culture, the ability to change direction, to set strategy, is for those leaders who have control of a PL. And where I think corporate America is still has work to do is to open the doors for people of color to run P&Ls that then leads to more opportunities, to a CEO opportunity, to, to major board seats, to shaping direction and strategy. And until you start to see within the walls of corporate America, more and more diversity running significant P&Ls, then we will only be scratching the surface of the potential of what we can do around the e &I. And what, what you bring up is has been the, the history of, of um, black and brown people in corporate America is that there are only certain positions that are appropriate for people of color and that the, the P&L positions, those of power are the ones that have traditionally been held back. So I think it's, I think it's terrific that you're bringing that to to the forefront and and talking about it openly and honestly. Yeah, Linda, the, you know, the other part of that, because I always try and take maybe spend a day in someone else's shoes, is you think about oftentimes 
the people running P&Ls reflect the, the majority of the customer base. Mm-hmm. And so when, when you start to question whether or not your customer base will embrace someone who looks differently than they do in a position of power. Now, remember, most of these companies are not, not for profit. They need to make a P&L. They need to, they need to generate revenue. Mm-hmm. So when you have someone running a P&L that's speaking for the company that has to deliver that big customer, you start to think about how will the customer see this person and what does that mean from a competitive perspective? Mm-hmm. And we need to deal with that fact. We need to deal with the fact that the majority of the people we do business with don't look like us. And so that gets to one of the reasons that I started this podcast, which is to help us feel more comfortable with each other on a personal human level when it comes to anything. You know, if we don't look the same way, we don't have the same skin color, we don't pray to the same deity, we don't have the same political views, whatever. So we're constantly otherizing each other. And how do you, how do you, how do you get to a point where you can be comfortable with someone who is different than you are and still respect them and still have empathy for them as another human being? And But if you don't have that as a basis to begin with on a human level, then when you take that and you extrapolate that into a corporate setting, you, you know what you're going to get, right? You're absolutely right. And so much of what uh, we all do, and we know this uh, inherently, is we do business with people that we trust. Mm-hmm. And so that trust curve, when you've had the same experiences, when you look exactly alike, is less steep than when you come from somewhere else and you don't look like the person you're dealing with. So I think it's so important for, in particular, people of color to understand how to build relationships across the spectrum. Uh, Back to just my transparency in corporate America uh, is we have to learn how to be vulnerable and transparent in order to build that to bring down the walls that separate us. And if I can do that with my customers, to your point, if I can get her or him to see me as a capable individual that can deliver, now it's up to me to deliver. And every single opportunity that I show up, that I deliver, builds that trust stronger and stronger, and then allows me to flourish in my career which is the opportunity, Linda, all of us want. Exactly, exactly. I would imagine that throughout the course of your career that you have had situations, um, either on a professional or a personal level, where you have been otherized. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything in particular that stands out in your mind that you could share with us as an example of that and how it made you feel, because I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, how it makes you feel when you are, are being otherized, and then how you dealt with it and what you learned from it. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It, there are so many things, uh, particularly being in the banking career as long as I've been in it, in this industry as long as I've been in it, that we go through to get to the level that I am. And I tell this story, you, you asked this question, when, you know, when you've been otherized. And, and let me start with the foundation of, of, from my perspective, where I think I am and how I show up inside of the walls of Wells Fargo. And back then it was a pre- predecessor organization, but I always feel like I'm one of the team. I am a lender on the team that is here to deliver the organization. I never think about it any differently. So early in my career, I was responsible for setting up a dinner with one of the top CEOs in town, a major corporation. And my manager said, let's have it at this country club in Atlanta. It was one of the oldest country clubs inside of Atlanta. Obviously, not one that I would be a member of. And I remember going, Linda, that night to the country club 
and parking in the first open spot that I saw as you know, a young 23, 24 year old, never being on that property, not necessarily being comfortable with where to go. But I parked, I walked inside of the club and there was no one there to greet me. So I started looking around slowly into rooms to see where my team may be for this dinner and didn't see anyone. And finally, I run into a young lady and I tell her uh, who I'm with and what I'm here for. And she says, oh, you guys are back around the corner in a private room. And she takes me to the room. As I am walking through this facility, I do what many of us are taught to do as a young age, at a young age, as people of color, we track, right? We notice the people that are around us. And I started to notice that all the people enjoying dinner and wine and conversation were white men and white women, and all the people serving them were Black. We go into the private room where now my customer is, my boss, and the gentleman who runs the group, they're all having a glass of wine. I walk in and a waiter who's a Black man takes my order. And I start to think, oh my God, I don't belong here. Mm. Linda, you can imagine when you walk into that opportunity and all you want to do is impress your customer with your understanding of, of their business, impress your leadership team with your ability to position the organization. But I spent most of that dinner fighting back this feeling of how can they possibly see me on par with them? How can they possibly understand what it's like to walk into a room where no one looks like you except the people that are serving you? Where my guess at the time, the membership was not diverse at all as it pertains to people of color. And I really struggled with trying to focus on doing the business at hand versus the emotions that were building up in me. As I've matured in my career, I've now learned how to compartmentalize that. I, I have learned how to be more comfortable with who I am and what I bring to the table. And frankly, Linda, it's their responsibility to make sure we are both comfortable in the environment that we're in. Right. And I'm sure that, that when that dinner was being set up, it never even occurred to, I think you said it was your boss mm -hmm. who, who had decided that the country club was the place to have this. Probably never even occurred to him how, what that dynamic would be for you as a woman of color. Exactly. And, and you think about that. It's not only it, not only did it not occur to him, but we see it play out every single day. We see it play out in things like having a holiday function at your home and inviting uh, maybe some of your hourly workers who don't live anywhere near your neighborhood mm -hmm. to a to a neighborhood they're uncomfortable with. In, in this, this environment that we exist in today and expect them to be comfortable in this space. It, it never occurs to us to, to ask a person of color, listen, why, you know, set up an event in a place that you'd like to have the event set up. Um, we're always the afterthought. And that has to change. If you want people to deliver their their best selves day in and day out. You have to have these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. So back to the country club for a moment. Did you, after the fact, ever have a conversation with your boss or anyone else about how you were feeling as that evening unfolded? I, I did not after the country club event, but shortly thereafter, we had a holiday party at his house. and. I walked into the party, or, or I ring the doorbell, 
and who greets me but the black woman dressed in what I think is a 1960 maid's outfit. Okay. Linda, I remember her asking me for my coat and I said, no, ma'am, I'll keep it. I walked into the party at his house. I found him. I said, I just want you to know that I did show up. I am now leaving. And I walked out. So the next day, of course, this was now the talk of the holiday party. The next day, his administrative assistant, who was a black woman, came in and she said, what did you do at this party? Everyone is talking about it. I said, listen, the fact that he does not recognize in Atlanta, in the South, the heart of civil rights, that he has a black woman dressed like a maid at a company holiday party is a problem. So it was at that point, not only did I speak with him, but I spoke to other leaders about how it made me feel, why other people of color never showed up to the event. It was interesting. His explanation was, well, she needed the extra money. That's perfectly fine. She did not need to look like the maids we see in the help. Wow. So that was very brave and courageous of you to do that. And I would imagine that when you determined that you were going to turn around and walk out of that party, that you knew you could be putting your job at risk, but you were willing to take that risk. Yeah, that was, you know, different than the country club. I I was rocked by the country club. I didn't know what to do. I also knew that I had to be professional at all times. Mm -hmm. So leaving that dinner at the country club was not an option. The holiday party was my time. It was unacceptable. And it crossed the line that I felt was inconsiderate and demonstrated a lack of inclusiveness in the group that I was in. And so did it lead to honest and open conversation about why you left and what it meant and how uh, those who are in positions of authority need to be more sensitive and inclusive as they are making plans of this type? Did it lead to those kinds of conversations? It, it absolutely did. It changed. Um, it, it changed how the office thought about certain things. And you could see, Linda, the other thing: people who would engage versus those that would not. Mm-hmm. So you you started to understand that there is a real fear around this conversation. There is a a real nervousness about saying the wrong thing. So it created an opportunity for me to say. Everything is a reasonable question if we're trying to get better. So it allowed me back to an earlier question you asked of being very vocal around DEI. It allowed me then to create that culture within the group that I was in to say, listen, there is nothing you can say in this conversation that will be offensive if it's done in the right way with the right heart. All we're simply trying to do is figure out how to work better together. Sure. And, yeah. and to me, that was, that was, that was the beauty of all of, of all of what I experienced in that short time frame was that ability to create a culture that says, I don't know how this lands on you. Can we talk about it? I love that. I don't know how this lands on you, but can we talk about it? That is, that is such a, that's the perfect way to phrase it because the, the the whole point is that you know we for the for the company's bottom line okay as you talked about you know these co- companies are for profit everybody needs to make money then you know there needs to be a revenue stream and and what is going to add to the bottom line study after study after study has shown that a more inclusive and a more diverse workforce where people feel as though they can bring all of themselves to work, that is going to positively and effectively impact the bottom line in a very, very positive way. And so then the question becomes, 
how do we work together in a more respectful and inclusive manner that allows us to feel safe in doing so and take away the fear, which is, you can take that, that argument in a corporate setting and then uh, broaden it out to society because that's, I mean, so much of what's going on right now is just because we're scared of each other. We're scared of people who don't look like us. And, 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 and then we don't take the time or feel that we don't have a safe enough space to get to know them. And so the fear just feeds upon itself and then we're, we're lost. You're absolutely right. Every great leader knows that the, the person they're leading, if they care about them, will run through a wall for them. And in order to do that, Linda, you have to build relationships. Yep. You have to know what's important to every single person you lead. And when you can convince the person you're leading, the team that you're leading, that they individually matter and collectively matter, there is nothing they won't do to help you be successful. And that's what it's about. But so many leaders I've seen are busy managing their own career that they forget what I think is the most important part of our job as a leader is to prepare someone to take my role, is to prepare someone to be better than I am, is to pave the way for the next leader to do more, to be more, and to deliver more. And when you come into it with that mindset, then that requires you to build relationships because I need to know you on a more intimate basis in order to allow you to, to, to achieve the things that are important to you. And it's a win-win for everyone. It is not that difficult. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. It is not that difficult, but it, but it requires a certain sense of, of self-awareness to be able to um, uh, articulate and, and, and execute what you just described as the qualities of an excellent leader. It sounds it, simple, but sometimes it's not. <laughs> it, it does, but it also, it, uh, you know, back to that self-awareness, it means that as leaders, we have to be open to get the feedback, right? I, I tell my team all the time, you got to tell me I'm nuts, right? If, if I am talking about something that you disagree with, just say, lady, you're all It your makes rockers. no sense. You're all <laughs> Yeah. Where and, did you get that? <laughs> well, it is, it is, again, so much of what I, what I, how I think about leadership is how I, I grew up as a basketball player and coaching. And, and, and tell our audience where you played basketball. We've been talking about this. <laughs> I, all this so, time. No. Yeah, so I, so I started playing ball, basketball at small school in Grenada High, at, at Grenada High School in Mississippi. And then I played college ball at Christian Brothers University. And, and Linda, when you're, on, when you're in the game, when you're in the action, your, your leader, your coach sees things on a big scale. But when you're in the moment as a player, you start to see tendencies and weaknesses of other players. And to be able to go to a coach, to be able to go to a leader in corporate America and say, this is what I'm seeing on the battlefield. Mm. Right? This is different than what you're telling me. When that leader has the faith and trust in the players on the battlefield, that's when you know the magic is real. That's when you know it works. And, and, and that is the, the feedback, the loop that has to happen as, as, as employees in corporate America, black, white, blue, gray, across the spectrum, male and female, in order for all of us to achieve our highest potential. And not every one of us was meant to be a CEO. Right? There are role players for a reason. But until you understand my potential, until you understand what drives me, until you get to know my dreams, then how can you ever lead me to the fullest potential of my career? And that's what we've got to do. I love that. I love that. And we started off this conversation by you talking about your mentoring style and how one of the first things you say to them is, you know, I, I want feedback from you. I want you to tell me how I'm doing. And, and that, that is truly the, the, the mark of a, of a leader. Um, 
as we close up, I just want to ask if there's anything that you want to leave our audience with. Um, and as words of inspiration, we're, you know, we're living in such a crazy, chaotic, challenging time. Um, as a leader of a, of a major corporation that is still conducting its business and trying to navigate the, the chaos along with all of its employees and the rest of us out here. Um, what, what would you like to leave us with today as we, as we move forward? Well, I think it's appropriate for us to take a minute here to acknowledge we're now on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Yes. And so I, I, I wanna acknowledge all the lives that were lost, the families that were impacted, the heroes that stepped in in the midst of chaos and certainly our, our employees here at Wells Fargo. But when you talk about inspiration, you think about that day and the days after it, how we came together as a people. We didn't see color. We didn't see gender. Countries came and stood by us and held us up and we held each other up. So when you think about this journey in corporate America, just know it doesn't take crisis for us to figure out how to pull for and with each other, to embrace and celebrate each other and to rise to the top. Your success is not to my detriment. Your success is to be celebrated and my success is to be celebrated. And when we are really good at it, we bring others up behind us. So I thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you. It is an incredibly humbling experience to talk with you. Um, this, is, this is just one of the best moments of my life and I thank you so much for it. Oh my goodness, thank you, Monica. I, I love everything that you said and especially the, the very last point that you made because there is enough for all of us. Your success does not have to be at my detriment. And as long as we embrace each other and remember how we did come together after 9-11, we can get there again. We just have to keep talking and keep working toward it. And thank goodness we have leaders like you who are willing to do that work. So thank you so much. It has been an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Take care. So many wonderful nuggets that Monica shared with us today. I so appreciate her taking the time to spend with us and to give you a little bit of insight into her leadership style and philosophy. I think there's a lot for all of us to take away. Thank you so much for giving Monica permission to speak and for having the courage to listen as always with an open mind. We look forward to seeing you here next time on our Voices Matter podcast. Thanks again to our sponsor, BMW of West Houston. There's a special offer for members of the Our Voices Matter podcast community. Just click the link in the show notes, bmwwest.com.